Live from Arlington, Virginia, this is Transport Topics Newsmakers, the digital interview series that gives you access to candid conversations between industry experts and a veteran reporter. Thanks go to our sponsor, Quality Carriers. Here's your host, Dan Ronan. Hello and welcome to this latest edition of Newsmakers from Transport Topics. I'm Dan Ronan. I'm pleased to host this conversation with leading figures in the trucking, freight, and logistics industries. Before we begin our conversation with Candace Paris with the Truckers Against Trafficking Organization and Sergeant Zach Hurd with the Illinois State Patrol, I want to tell you that Quality Carriers is the sponsor for this edition of Newsmakers. Their leadership has a short message they'd like to convey to all of you. So let's watch the message together, and we'll be back with Kentis and Zach on the other side after this message. Hi, I'm Randy Strutz, President of Quality Carriers, a division of CSX. As the leading bulk chemical carrier in North America, with over 100 locations, over 2,500 drivers, and servicing the top chemical customers, we are proud to support Truckers Against Trafficking as a corporate sponsor. Truckers Against Trafficking was formed to combat human trafficking throughout North America. Please join Truckers Against Trafficking if you're not already a member in their fight against this criminal enterprise. Thanks so much for your time. First, a brief introduction about our two guests. Candace Paris is the co-founder and the executive director of Truckers Against Trafficking. She joins us from Denver. It's a nonprofit organization that educates, empowers, and mobilizes members of the trucking and travel plaza industry to combat domestic commercial sex trafficking. During her time in leadership in the role at that organization, they have trained more than 1.2 million truck drivers, bus drivers, and truck stop employees how to spot commercial sex trafficking and teach them to be the eyes and ears of the roadway. Sergeant Zach Hurd is with the Illinois State Patrol. He joins us from outside of St. Louis on the Illinois side of the line. And as you may remember, we had Kendis on with us on the newsmakers earlier this summer. And the response that we got to the broadcast was so overwhelming that we invited her back on again. And we wanted to bring a law enforcement official on the, the conversation to discuss with him what some of the things that police officers and others in that community are seeing on the front lines and also discuss with them some of the important training that they've undergone. Welcome to both of you. It's good to have you back on Newsmakers. Candace and Sergeant Hurd, thank you for joining us as well. My pleasure, Dan. My pleasure as well, Dan. Happy to be here. Candace, so I ask this question in the most general terms. How, how large of a scope of problem are we talking about here across the country in terms of commercial sex trafficking? Well, the global number is around 40 million victims of human trafficking. Um, the, in regards to the United States, the, the scope can differ um, only because a lot of the information around human trafficking, there's a lot of dark numbers due to lack of reporting or um, reporting for, for light crimes. Uh, but the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children estimates um, that hundreds of thousands of children are at risk or vulnerable to being sold in the commercial sex trade every year. Um, and you're talking, you know, kids that are coming um, from abusive home situations, runaways, and certainly kids that are just out there on the streets and, and more vulnerable. Um, but we're also seeing kids that are um, coming from two parent homes and have been recruited online um, or uh, recruited in places uh, where kids often hang out uh, malls and, and out of schools even. So um, this is a crime that is happening in every state in the United States and certainly um, in just about every neighborhood. Sergeant Hurd, as someone who's in law enforcement and been out there on the front lines in Illinois, uh, let's talk about some of the things that you've experienced and seen while in a patrol car in the state of Illinois. Talk about some of the experiences that you've seen in terms of commercial sex trafficking. 
uh, similar to what Candace has said, um, there's all kinds of victims. Um, I would say particularly mostly women, uh, but a lot of children involved as well. Um, details of specific cases ongoing, uh, obviously I won't share, but there tends to be a common theme with, with who's at risk and vulnerabilities that are commonly exploited by the trafficker. Uh, because traffic, human trafficking and sex trafficking in particular are all about control. Uh, it's exploiting another person for your financial benefit. Um, and so some of those vulnerabilities include uh, uh, homelessness, um, lack of self-esteem, um, poverty, uh, lack of any, any social assets or, or, or earthly assets, food, um, and substance abuse, um, and, and communities that, that are repressed or, or don't have a voice that they can come out with, the LGBTQs. Uh, or, or children that are abused um, that understand and, and know that lifestyle already, um, a, a traffickers right there to, to take them in uh, and continue it for them. I'll ask this question to both of you, and I'll start with you, Sergeant Hurt. Is there a type of personality or person who is a trafficker that uh, deals in this type of uh, human slavery? Good question. Um, so I'd say that, you know, uh, as a society, we like to group people into categories, right? It's easy for us. Uh, uh, you want to be able to predict, predict people. Um, and, and we want to say, oh, hey, that, that's a good person. That's a bad person. And uh, it's not that at all. Uh, I, I don't think there's good and bad people. I think crime is the product of need and opportunity. Uh, and those needs can come in all, in all different segments of life maybe financial, maybe egotistical, maybe prideful, uh, maybe sexual, right? Um, so the trafficker is someone that I would say that in their makeup probably lacks a bit of empathy, that they're willing to exploit another for their financial gain. Um, but there is no typecast person for it. It's just a person who's needed an opportunity and circumstances um, whether it's culturally or, or, or through their life and what they've experienced that has led them to this, uh, that they've decided to use somebody for their financial benefit. Candice, I'll, I'll address the same question to you. Yeah, you know, along those same lines, I, I, I do think they're, uh, the, traffickers come from all different backgrounds, all walks of life. And you have traffickers who are coming out of gang backgrounds. Um, and this is part of the gang activity, the criminal activity of organized crime involved in this. So you have, um, you know, millions and millions of dollars uh, tied in, up in this. You know, some of the drug traffickers um, have also gotten involved in sex trafficking because they find that they can make money, um, you know, using the same routes that they push them and sell drugs. They also exploit people. And then you certainly have just crime of opportunity. Um, you know, there are cases involving former firefighters. There are uh, cases involving veterans. There are cases involving law enforcement officers. There are cases involving truck drivers, right? It's, it's no one particular field or industry um, where we're coming, uh, where traffickers can come out of. It's certainly crime of opportunity. Um, and somebody who really is willing to exploit somebody else for their, for their personal benefit. But one thing, Dan, I do want to I do want to draw out. Unfortunately, one of the things that we are seeing is in our culture this kind of acceptance around pimp culture, right? Mm. Um, and how we talk about like I mean, it's even a show, "Pimp My Ride," or or that's pimping, or whatever it may be. And we have to be really careful around our language because we're raising our children um, either to think pimping is cool or something that shouldn't be feared. Um, I will share a story from my own personal life, which is shocking. Uh, my own daughter uh, works, uh, used to work at a coffee shop, and she was on her shift a few months ago. And a guy comes into the coffee shop and starts chatting her up, and she's being friendly and taking his order. And about two minutes in, he asks her, do you have a pimp? <laughs> Who's your pimp, right? Like, this is wow. a question he's asking my teenage daughter behind the counter. Now, my daughter you better believe, knows what a pimp is. And so immediately she puts her head down, she goes in the back room and she gets her boss. And that guy, the video caught him fleeing the store. But too often there are young girls who think pimp, what's a pimp? I mean, a pimp is cool. A pimp is, you know, glorified. There's pimp is nothing to be afraid of. 
And so we need to be talking to our kids about what pimps really are. And we certainly need to be educating our young boys who are hearing this influx of how being a pimp is cool or a quick and easy way to make money. The fact that a pimp really in reality is a slave driver. Wow, that is uh, quite a story. And uh, thankfully your daughter has uh, some pretty, uh, A, some strong uh, commitments and some strong, uh, strong backbone backbone and knew what to do. Yeah. And, and again, part of it and my, my poor kids, they probably hear too much. Um, but this is again, why Tat um, and every presentation is talking about talk to your kids, talk to your kids, talk to your kids. Um, so uh, yeah, this is, this is, it's both sides of the spectrum. Um, we certainly have to be on the lookout for the perpetrators, but we certainly should be raising the next generation um, not to be glorifying pimp culture. Does that also come down to, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll address this to both of you, that uh, we are undergoing in society right now a transition with regards to respect for women in terms of women's equality, uh, whether it's uh, pay, sell, pay, whatever it is. I read a story today in the Washington Post about a sports team that has uh, some serious problems with a culture that is misogynistic. Are we undergoing a transition in society in that? And that, do you think that will will be felt in this this area as well? You know, I I think you see progress in some places, and 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 in other places you don't. Um, I do think it's really contextual. I think where you have people who are seeking to be thoughtful, um, seeking to recognize right just the equality in every human being. Um, and also just the great value, right? I mean, that's another thing traffickers have in common is, is obviously they dehumanize uh, their victims, right? To them, they're just products to be bought and sold. And so if you're already coming from this place where women are seen as sexual objects or objectified in any way, meaning they're less than, um, then it's, you know, it fits into your paradigm, right? It fits into your cultural paradigm that this is acceptable, that this is okay. Um, so I do think, again, this is something that, you know, whether it's misogyny or, you know, sexism or sexual objectification, um, I think porn plays a huge role in this, the demand for younger and younger victims. Plenty of victims are trafficked behind the screen, but, but think about how porn, right, also raising the next generation um, helps to objectify and sex, um, sexualize women in a way that, again, makes this kind of thing, one, it creates a demand for commercial sex. And again, if we didn't have any buyers, we wouldn't have any victims. Um, but two, yes, it certainly does play into the fact that women can be objects or, you know, that we can be seen as objects to be bought and sold and used. Sergeant Hurd, I want to talk about some of the training programs that uh, law enforcement officers such as yourself and those in the trucking industry have undergone to recognize commercial sex trafficking. Talk about some of the training that you and others in the Illinois State Patrol have, have to undergone uh, to go through this program. Yeah, Dan. Uh, so I've, I've, I've been in policing for 15 years now, and sadly, uh, the training has been lacking for me personally up until recently. Uh, and that's probably for a myriad of reasons. Uh, awareness being probably paramount, not, not knowing what it is uh, and what it looks like. Um, and the fact that federally it became a law in 2000. So it's, it's fairly new uh, in those aspects, but like, like we've talked about before, it's, it's, it's not a new form of oppression. It's probably the oldest there is. Um, but exciting um, now that, that we are uh, more aware and learning how to combat it more. Uh, and and I'm, I'm on the, a part of uh, a federal task force that we've been granted. Uh, for Central Illinois, and uh, we applied for the grant, uh, demonstrated how Central Illinois was a hotbed for trafficking, uh, human trafficking, both labor and sex, uh, and and how we could address it. Uh, so I'll be uh, the primary instructor for that, uh, and I'll travel and, and hopefully uh, touch as many law enforcement agencies in Central Illinois as I can. Um, but on that level of training, it, it, it's my pleasure to be here with Candice because for me, it was a four hour class um, put on by Truckers Against Trafficking that gave me the face of a victim, of a survivor. Um, and it was that that was 
most impactful for me and, and started my journey of, hey, how can I help this? How can I, as law enforcement, as an arm of the government, how can I help stop this and how can I help free somebody and hold to account somebody who chooses to exploit another? Um, so uh, on the face, you'd think that's odd, you know, a not-for-profit organization that had to, that had to come to law enforcement, but they, they saw the need and they filled that gap and um, they're doing an amazing job of it, uh, of the awareness. And um, hopefully the, the task force I'm involved in will move it forward uh, even more. Sergeant Hurd, you just made a point that, that I find astounding and I, I want to sort of expand on that a little bit. You're in central Illinois, and, and I have family from central Illinois and uh, some, some uh, roots down in that part of the country, Effingham, Lodi, Buckley, Kankakee, I can name those towns. I don't think of those communities as uh, hotbeds for sex trafficking. I think of them as, you know, small to medium-sized towns, Peoria, uh, towns like that, that are uh, nice communities, uh, you know, universities in their communities, a lot of farm, a lot of agriculture, uh, very close knit uh, churches, community centers, that sort of thing. I don't think of those as sex trafficking. I think of possibly the city. I'm from Chicago or Milwaukee or something like that. Big city, big town, big complex issues. I don't think of Effingham, Illinois, or uh, or Rantoul as a, a sex trafficking, you know, hotbed. Right. Good question. Uh, again, um, kind of as we opened up. Uh, you know, you asked, is there, is there a, a, a person that's uh, more inclined to be a trafficker or to exploit somebody? And for me, like I've said uh, at the beginning, uh, crime is a product of need and opportunity. So what greater need is there amongst society um, than for everybody who's passed through puberty, they have sexual needs, period, period. So um, if there's that much need, there's going to be someone wanting to fill the opportunity, someone wanting to exploit it. And if they don't think that they have legitimate opportunities or they've chosen to engage in a, in a black market um, cash venue um, then, or, or whatever their life circumstances have led to, that they genuinely think this is, this is a good opportunity, uh, like Kenda said about uh, uh, Drug trafficking lends itself well to, to fall into then human trafficking. So someone that chooses to sell a, a, a kilo of cocaine can sell that kilo of cocaine one time. How many times can you sell a 15-year-old girl? How many times can you sell a 22-year-old girl? How many times can you sell a 13-year-old boy? Uh, so so there's, they can monetize a human being far more than they can um, a consumable narcotic. Uh, once it's consumed, it's done. Uh, so... Um, and being the Midwest, uh, the crossroads of the country, um, yeah. there's a lot of passing through. Uh, and like you said, a, a big city, a, a metropolitan area lends itself to a, a transient people coming in for work for the week and then leaving or coming in to enjoy the sites and, and take part in, in um, the travel and then leave. Now that lends itself to somebody who's going to engage in, in maybe some, some nefarious or something that they're away from home, something they wouldn't do at home. Um, and that lends itself people traveling through, through, through a state too. Um, but it, it happens in every community. Uh, we can't have these preconceived notions anymore that it, that it's only something that happens in Chicago or only something that happens in Las Vegas or only something that happens in LA. Um, it, there's familial trafficking in every town. There's, there's someone trying to profit off somebody else everywhere. Yeah, and there's an interstate uh, that's close by that uh, runs, you know, I-55 runs right through the heart of Illinois. I mean, it's, you know, there it is. Uh, Candace, is there any particular demographic or person who's more vulnerable to being trafficked in, in sex trafficking? And what are some of the signs that a person may be a victim? I, I guess I can offer this question to both of you since Sergeant Hurd, you see it from the law enforcement side and Candace, you see it from the, running the nonprofit. So talk, Candace, first about that. You know, um, one of the glaring statistics around this crime is that disproportionately victims of human trafficking, specifically sex trafficking, are women and girls of color. And disproportionately, the buyers of those victims are white men. And so we do have to look at the systemic racism involved in sex trafficking, again, creating this population that 
Um, people feel it's okay to buy and sell. Um, and again, exploiting um, any kind of uh, vulnerabilities, other pre-existing vulnerabilities, like we talked about poverty, um, homelessness, um, whatever it may be. Um, but that's a huge issue and that's a huge um, uh, reality when it comes to uh, some of the things that buyers are looking for. Um, and, you know, what, we, what we've been hearing from law enforcement and some of these reports, but also the service providers, is that um, buyers even expect more base acts from women and girls of color. They also pay them less, right? I mean, you even see that racism showing up in this. Um, so they're treated with more violence, with more disrespect, um, they're paid less and right, they're exploited more often. So I think that's a that's a huge um, uh, so, you know that's a that's a huge factor that we have to keep in, in mind when we're looking for potential victims of human trafficking, right? And making sure that we have no preconceived notions that you know all sex trafficking victims are thirteen year old white girls, right? Um, you know what? She could be, you know, a 25 year old uh, Latina. Um, and you know what? She's not going to necessarily present as somebody who's like, please help me right now. Um, she could have a lot of attitude. I mean, imagine if you're raped 10 to 12 to 20 times a day and you're beaten and all you're told of what you're good for, right, is, is to be raped um, and bring your pimp money. What kind of attitude are you going to have, right? Um, so, you know, the, it, it's, it's going to vary when we're talking about the trucking industry and signs to look for. Uh, you know, obviously we're, we're talking about any signs that commercial sex is being sold. The girls are young women. Sometimes, like Sergeant Hurd said, it is also boys. It's transgender uh, individuals. Um, again, going from door to door, knocking, um, asking for commercial company. Do you want to date? Um, any kind of CV chatter on the radio. Uh, uh, same kind of thing. Um, somebody looking to sell sex. Um, any signs that or any conversations around the need to make a quota? Why do they have to make a quota? Well, there's usually on somebody, you know, on the other end forcing them to make that quota. And if they don't make that quota, then they're beaten. Um, talk of a boyfriend, right? A boyfriend who's putting them out there. Uh, you know, a good boyfriend isn't going to ask you to sleep with men for money, right? Um, obviously, somebody who has no idea where they are, they're not in control of their own identification. You know, some of those questions you can just ask, like, when's the last time you've seen your family? You know, if they, if they can't answer that question or are they free to come and go as they please, you know, I mean, these are some of those questions that the drivers have asked and can ask when they're actually interacting with potential victims. Um, and then again, even saying, hey, can I, can I, do you need help? Can we just make a call? You can call the hotline number together um, to access victim services, right? Or obviously, if you're seeing a crime in progress, call 911. You're seeing a child being sold for sex, anyone under age, you need to call 911. You need to get law enforcement out there immediately. Sergeant Hurd, I'll ask the same question for you because you see it, as I said, from your uh, squad car in central Illinois. Uh, so, so the question was, what, what does the victim of sex trafficking look like? Yeah. Yeah. Um, looks like all of us, right? Uh, there are people that lend themselves, uh, their vulnerabilities lend themselves uh, more likely. Um, but like Kenda says, what, what I look for uh, and what a driver could look for, what, what somebody should look for is uh, somebody that lacks freedom. So that's simple to say, but what does that look like? And Kenda said it. They don't possess their own ID, right? Um, they don't possess their own money. Um, maybe they're not dressed equally with the person that, that, they're, that they're with. Right? Maybe this, this person's dressed flashy, no pockets, skin tight clothing, but the, the male the male she's with is 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 casually dressed, right? So in a, in a symbiotic relationship, both parties should benefit. Both parties should equally benefit, both parties should have equal access um, to 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 the benefits of, of that relationship. Uh, and so when someone when the balance of power is off or when someone is is standing out on the corner or in front of those diesel fuel pumps at the truck stop where it's the bugs are out biting, where it's hot and humid, where maybe it's cold. Um, and they're standing there looking at their phone and, and walking in front of the pumps. Well, 
why is the male sitting in the car? I saw them interact once. You know, what, if this is a symbiotic relationship, if that's his girlfriend, shouldn't she be able to sit in the car as, as well? Um, so it, it, it comes down to a lot of nuance and innuendo, but, but it's really pretty simple when, when you boil it down. Hey, that, that relationship doesn't look right. Um, and, and it's all about control. And, and part of um, one of the major forms of control uh, is control through mutilation. That's what I call it. And it might like branding. So that when this victim now looks in the mirror, they see every time, oh no, I'm property. Oh no, I'm not free. And I never will be now because now I'm scarred. Now I've been changed. Um, and, and, and you can see some, some of those signs, uh, some, some um, very boisterous tattoos, tattoos in certain spots, tattoos of certain things um, that generally the general public may not be that aware of. Uh, but now you can see it uh, and, and be a little more aware. Crowns. Why would someone have a giant crown on them? Why would they have somebody else's name on their neck? Why would they have, um, you know, fruit bearing all around their face and their, the back of their ears and, and different areas, you know, um, that, that's, that's what I look for. Someone that lacks their freedom or someone that's not making their own choices. Candace, uh, and again, to both of you as well, uh, but don't the, the, the clients, the people who buy the sex, don't they have a certain responsibility in this as well? You know, for a long time, as you know, uh, prostitution has been labeled as a victimless crime. It's a uh, consensual transaction between two people for, for sex. And yet uh, we tend to uh, give, the, give the person who's buying the sex all too often a pass, don't we? Uh, unfortunately, yes, Dan. Uh, all too often the buyer, and by the way, I'll say it again, no buyer, no victim, no sex trafficking. The buyer or the rapist, um, because if that person is not choosing to be out there, um, then what you're doing is rape for profit. Uh, is the one fueling the sex trade, is the one ultimately creating the demand for people to be trafficked into the sex trade. And so um, this is definitely the heart of the crime. We are seeing um, quite a few units actually do reverse stings uh, where they are looking now to round up the buyers, to arrest the buyers. Um, we've seen reverse stings where law enforcement again thankfully no victims are involved but just again trying to put out um, some false ads around who will purchase sex for minors well that's a felony um, and so we're seeing people who are not just obviously losing their jobs but they're going to jail because again they're looking to uh, have sex rape a 13 year old uh, so i think you know the trends, it depends. A lot of times it depends on what state you're in. Um, but this is definitely something that the broader abolitionist movement is certainly aware of and the, the need to address demand. This crime does not happen in a vacuum. If you are purchasing commercial sex, you are helping to fuel the sex trade, plain and simple. Sergeant Hurd, what, about, what are your thoughts on that in terms of uh, the, the person who is purchasing the sex, uh, taking a different look at how their role fits into all of this and to sit the nail on the head right if there is no buyer there is no crime period uh, so but there's a there, there's a <laughs> simple simple statement uh, not an easy fix uh, and and we've talked about it on isn't that on, true in every isn't that true in everything there's a simple right. statement but it's not an easy fix right and, and we we talked about i think one of the biggest drivers of this that's gonna that's gonna really drive this um, for the next few decades is, is pornography, right? That's giving young boys an unrealistic view of what sex is, of what a healthy relationship is, and it's giving a, a young girls, un, uh, uh, you know, unnatural and, and unhealthy expectations of what sex is, um, and and so that's gonna manifest itself into um, more victims and more buyers, naturally. Uh, so, so it's on all of us um, to, to, to stop the buyer, to stop the pornography, to stop um, the unreal expectations um, that, are, that go into that. And, and, and a, the age at which it's accessible and consumed now 
is gotten younger and younger um, through through the use of of the internet and smartphones and social media. Um, and quite honestly, social media has given a, a huge lever of coercion for an exploiter, for a trafficker, for a handler, right? Um, t- take any 13-year-old, boy or girl. The only thing you want in life is acceptance. We talked about some vulnerabilities, low self-esteem, emotional distress, lack of safety. I've just described every teenager in America, right? And so you give someone who's got a, an exploitive personality or someone who, who has learned um, from culture or video games or songs or whatever it is that, hey, you know what, I can monetize this woman and it's going to be good for me or I can monetize this kid and it's going to be good for me. All, all you have to do is get a picture of them that's vulnerable, get a video of them that's vulnerable, get something vulnerable. And now you say, hey, guess what? You don't do this for me. This gets broadcasted to the world. And, and what do you have there? You have someone willing to do anything to not be, to not be exploited digitally. And now they're being exploited physically every day. Wow. Candace, how's the trucking industry doing? We've got about uh, five minutes left. I want to circle back with our industry trucking. Uh, are the truck stop plaza owners and the operators and those who run the rest stops? And again, Sergeant, I'll ask you this because you see from the law enforcement side, are they pretty much in tune with the message and, uh, in doing what they can to help and make sure that uh, this type of activity doesn't take place on their property? Well, we've got a good solid chunk of the trucking industry on board. You know, like you've mentioned early on, 1.2 million registered as TAP train. The majority of those are professional drivers. Uh, We certainly have some of the largest truck stop chains on board with us, which is fantastic. Um, But there's, there's quite a ways to go. So I'm appreciative for programs like this to help us continue to get the word out there. Um, But I will tell you, you know, our latest Harriet Tubman Award winner this year was actually a truck stop employee by the name of Jessica Chapman. She works for Sap Brothers. Uh, She was working the night shift. A man and a woman came in. Uh, She could tell that the woman, something wasn't quite right. Talk about that symbiotic relationship. So she caught the woman's eye and she was like, are you okay? And the woman was starting to signal, no, she really wasn't. And so Jessica, who has TAT training through Sap Brothers Help Now program, their campaign in conjunction with us, Um, took down a rewards application. How smart is she? And pretended like she's filling out the rewards application for this woman. In the meantime, she's taking down all the information for law enforcement, who she promptly called and arrived at the scene. And sure enough, that man had sexually exploited that woman. And so he was arrested and she was taken into protective custody. Um, And so that's the kind of quick thinking. And that's also like, talk about the right place at the right time, right? And so Tad is all about activating the bystander right? And taking these people who are in the right place at the right time, if they understand what to look for, they really can make a difference in the lives of these individuals. Um, And just to know that somebody cares um, and to have the cops arrive so quickly. I mean, that's, that's exactly what this is all about. So um, we hope to see more and more Jessicas. (laughs) We hope to see um, more and more members of the trucking industry just continue to make those calls, call immediately, Um, Get as many details as you can for law enforcement, um, because that's how they're going to be able to take this and turn this into an actual case. Sergeant Hurd, is the trucking industry doing enough? We've got about uh, two minutes left. Are any of us doing enough? (laughs) But I think they're doing an amazing, an amazing job. Uh, They are the, 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 the eyes and ears of the roadway Uh, and, and situations like Candace just described is amazing. Uh, and, and what I would say to that is, is uh, the awareness training and, and what she did there, um, she was looking at that man and woman, not as the next customer, not as uh, a, a white man or a black man or a, a Hispanic female or someone. She looked at them as an individual and she recognized that that woman was not in a healthy symbiotic relationship and she reached out to her individual to individual and she had the awareness to do it in such a great way uh, and, 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 that victim had the strength and courage to reach out. Um, Cause quite honestly, once you fall under a, a certain level of control, you, the chances that I've seen of someone willing, willing to speak for themselves, willing uh, to, to escape uh, the further and further it goes, the less likely they are um, because now they've been isolated so far. They've been controlled through so much deprivation. Um, so I would just say truck drivers, Look at it. Look at everybody's an individual. That's not a car in front of you. That's not another truck in front of you. That's not another truck driver. That's not, that's an individual, you know, um, like I said, it right from the beginning society, we want, we want to categorize people. 
You know, um, we want people to fall into a category because then they're predictable, then it's easy. And then, but we're individuals. I'm not a police officer. I'm not a white male. You know, I'm Zach, you know, you're Dan. And when we look at each other as individuals, that's what we all want. That's what we all want. We don't want to be um, in, a, in a category or categorized or, or looked at as a prostitute or, or, or looked even to even take it further, looked at as a pimp, right? So here, I'll, I'll tell you this, pain that isn't transformed is transferred, right? So maybe the trafficker himself was a victim. And this is the only way he knows, the only thing he knows. And so his pain that wasn't transformed and fixed and someone didn't help him, he's now transferring it. You know, so, so I would just say, yes, the trucking industry is doing enough, but we as society in America, we need to look at each other as individuals. Stop categorizing. Look at each other as individuals. That's what we all want. We want to be recognized as an individual and individually important, not group important, not category important, individually important. Great closing thoughts, Zach. We appreciate uh, you and Candice making time to chat with us. And Candice, this is the second uh, uh, Newsmakers we've done in about the last six months with you. And I know we're going to do this again uh, because this is such a, an incredibly important topic. So thanks to both of you for being available and making, it, uh, making your time available. In closing, we want to thank our sponsor, Quality Carriers, for making this Transport Topics Newsmakers webcast possible. We appreciate their fine support. We also thank Sergeant Zach Hurd with the Illinois State Patrol and Candace Paris, who runs Truckers Against Trafficking for being so generous with their time to answer our questions. Going forward, we're planning more of these newsmakers about once a month in the very near future, and we'll have an announcement soon about who our next guest will be and when the webcast will take place. I know that will be a great program and we're very excited about that upcoming announcement. Also, this webcast is available for on-demand viewing. Go to ttnews.com for more information about how you can catch our interview with Kendis and Sergeant and Sergeant Hurd. Again, I'm Dan Ronan with ttnews.com. Thank you for watching. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. For more information on future episodes, visit ttnews.com. This has been Transport Topics Newsmakers.